Plans for China's economy for 2021 second half are mapped out in a meeting of the Politburo of Communist Party of China's Central Committee on July the 30th. According to government data, China's GDP growth rate reached about 12.7 percent in the first half of the year, which leads the world in economic recovery. But the COVID-19 pandemic is still evolving, and the recent outbreak in Nanjing and other cities are a grim reminder that pandemic prevention has great challenges. So how can the economic growth be balanced with public health measures and what government's philosophy could be taken for sound economic work? Let's loop in our panelists from both China and the U.S. For the latest on the Chinese economy in Washington, D.C., Arthur Dong, professor at Georgetown University's McDonald School of Business in Hong Kong, Edward Xie, chairman and CEO of Gaofeng Advisory Company in Beijing, Xu Sitao, chief economist from Deloitte, China. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. There are a lot of numbers we should dive in and also a lot of latest policy adjustments coming from the Chinese side regarding Chinese economy. But first of all, I would like to ask all of you about the impact of latest uh, Delta variants on economies, both China and the U.S. Let me go with you, Mr. Xu, on China's. Delta variant clearly uh, is resulting more uh, anxiety and jitters. Um, but I think the broader direction remains unchanged. Global economy is recovering, and the vaccine rollout is proceeding. This is true for most economies. So our baseline scenario remains unchanged. Mm. The Chinese economy is likely to grow around 8 to 8.2 percent. That's okay. our forecast. So short-term impact, Mr. Xie? <clears throat> I think in the short term, uh, the overhang of the concern about the pandemic is not going away. Uh, even in China, as you know, uh, we have some outbreaks, but nonetheless, uh, you know, it's happening. And I think people are, uh, are concerned it's not going away, it's creating more uncertainty, uh, in my view, on the economic, short term economic outlook for many other right. countries. Short term, very important, of course. Uh, Professor Dong, what about the impact on the U.S. economy? Chinese and U.S. economy always very much interlinked. Yes, uh, thank you, Wei. It's always good to be with you. I would agree with uh, Dr. Z as well as Mr. Xu in terms of the global impact of the COVID. With the, the globe in the United States is right now on the path to recovery. And so far as the effect on the United States, the first half GDP was close to 6%. But the big uh, uh, issue that's looming on, looming on the horizon is that there's a high degree of anxiety with regard to the return of COVID, mm -hmm. as only 50% of the American population has been vaccinated. And so this is a cause for concerns, and even Goldman Sachs has restated its outlook for the second half of the, of, of, of the United States in terms of GDP, right. because this, a, this is a looming risk on the horizon because there may be shutdowns as a result of the growing spread of the Delta variant. Mm. Having said that, though, Mr. Xu, uh, over the weekend, the uh, uh, Central Politburo meeting on the latest uh, Chinese uh, economic uh, policies very much attracting attention. Uh, how, how do you see the result of it? I think the result of this meeting is the focus is to uh, support growth. In fact, before this meeting, the reduction of reserve requirement rate a few weeks ago, mm. I think already uh, sending that message. Um, the issue is not about this year. This year, because the base effect from last year was so strong. So this year, the, the growth number is going to be high, at least 8%. Uh, but going forward, I think policymakers are beginning to worry not just about the headline growth and also about inflation, uh, high commodity uh, uh, price impact right. on manufacturing right. sector, so on and so forth. Mm. One trillion yuan, that's what you're referring to uh, from the uh, bank reserve ratio. That means uh, one trillion yuan already into the market, <clears> and that's <throat> about 154 billion U.S. dollars. But that is likely to be short-term, uh, Mr. Xie. What is your take about that? 
Yeah, uh, I think the signals that they're sending out is that they're looking for uh, more high quality and inclusive growth. Uh, that that means they're looking at not, not only in the short term, but also a longer term growth of the Chinese nation. And, you know, the implication for various sectors and various segments in the society. Uh, yeah. But what about the question about the uh, Chinese firms listing overseas that create such a stir among international investors? And of course, about the Chinese education tech firms. <clears throat> Yeah, I think uh, you know this has been uh, exacerbated by the recent event uh, with uh, Didi, uh, who uh, went uh, IPO in New York. At the same time, I, I think the Chinese regulators are now uh, at least saying that uh, they have not fully complied with the national, you know, uh, data security scrutiny. Uh, and so I, I think this is a big issue that both the Chinese regulators as well as the uh, New York uh, stock exchange are now trying to deal with uh, this, uh, but there's no framework on how to deal with that yet. So right now, uh, I believe this is the pretty reason why this short term measure has been announced. Over mm -hmm. time, I'm sure things will get sorted out. But in the meantime, you know, data security, cyber security, all these things are critical. It's not only in a way, right, Chinese companies going to the US, but also I think many US companies operating in China are I actually see. going to be facing with the same issue. Professor Dong. Uh, oh, yes. Yes, Wei. Uh, with regard to uh, what was just spoken by uh, Edward, yes, uh, I do believe moving forward that uh, President Biden has directed the Securities and Exchange Commission here in the United States to uh, impose further scrutiny as well as impose conditions on Chinese companies that are considering a listing in the United States. And those conditions are going to tighten up or impose stricter regulations with regard to you know a Chinese company seeking to have a listing mm. in the United States. And so this is one of many sort of challenges I think that are going to be faced by Chinese companies as they consider uh, listing and, and accessing the capital markets in the United States. Now with regard to the comments about the Chinese educational firms and the private firms, many of which are publicly mm. listed, uh, that certainly has sent a warning shot, you know, throughout the entire Chinese economy, and as well as, you know, looking at those stocks that certainly, you know, have uh, seen a considerable amount of, uh, of value uh, right. loss. And I think a lot of it has to do with perhaps trying to find a way to depressurize or take some of the stress out of uh, the average middle class family's life in China as they spend an inordinate amount of their salaries and savings on private tutoring for their True. children. And if they spend on that, that means they can't spend on the economy. Professor Dong, we see a mixture of uh, comments uh, coming from, for example, analysts uh, in the United States. Uh, some have been suggesting exactly what you just said, that it's supposed to take the pressure off from the Chinese middle class. There are also comments about uh, whether that's going to impact on investors' uh, confidence in China. So how do you see this mixture of comments uh, coming from your side of the world? Well, certainly here in the United States, investors who have invested in those companies, both on the institutional and in individual side, they've suffered some losses, you know, as a result of the downdraft and the value of those stocks. And so in order to calm the nerves of investors here in the United States, uh, more clarity has to come forward from policy officials in China. And we saw that most recently a few days ago when uh, the economic ministers reached out and the securities ministers reached out and informed a group uh, of you know highly informed you know wall street professionals and leaders of wall street right. uh, banks uh, that china was uh, was was going to take measured steps uh, with with regard and they should what? have a continued confidence in in the investment in yeah, china what you are referring to is the head of the uh, uh, securities and regulatory commission uh, the deputy Correct. head of uh, that specific organization reaching out to investors. And, and Mr. Xu, if you look at this statement coming out of the weekend uh, Central Politburo on economic policy in China, there are several sentences describing the sustainability, consistency, and stability of the policies. Now, uh, given what we just uh, earlier discussed, uh, how do you see you know, China's uh, uh, attitude uh, toward the policy adjustments, its 
unique type of governance style, which is more government policy driven, and also uh, its takeaways from some of the latest rounds of uh, market and private firm investor interactions. Mr. Xu, sorry for my loaded question, but I thought I need to put in more information into this question. Sure. Um, I think this sentence is related to the very first question you have raised um, about economic outlook against the backdrop of Delta variant, against the backdrop of high commodity prices, against the backdrop of high valuation of asset prices, not just in China, globally. Yeah. So yeah. from policy uh, makers' perspective, they would uh, like to maintain continuity of the policy. Uh, in practice, that means uh, no hasty withdrawal of liquidity and accommodative policies which were implemented during um, uh, in past two years. In other words, um, both central bank and the Ministry of Finance are going to take a very gradual approach mm -hmm. in uh, phasing out uh, all these accommodative policies uh, the next six months mm -hmm. or even longer. Mm -hmm. Again, on continuity, um, referring to your earlier discussion with the other two gentlemen, uh, I suspect what policymakers were trying to convey is improving communication with the market. We do see also in the Central Politburo meeting readout, there is likely to be more encouragement to uh, uh, make sure there's going to be reliable supply chain and industrial chains, and there's going to be encouragement for the coming of a small and medium-sized companies that are going to fill in the vacuum of those chains. How do you see that, uh, especially when you have uh, geopolitics and the global supply chains being disrupted both by that and the pandemic? Um, we all know Chinese economy has been recovering strongly. We also know uh, the focus has been resumption of business since uh, early uh, 2020. However, we also know high uh, commodity prices mm. are hurting uh, manufacturing uh, uh, industries and particularly small and medium-sized ones. Right. So I foresee tax cut and relief and really aimed at uh, alleviating some of the difficulties mm. um, subject to um, SMEs. I see. Uh, Professor Dong, I want to go to you about that. Uh, we see the U.S. Uh, GDP number <coughs> dropping compared to expectations, 6.5%. Uh, that's two points lower than the earlier expectations. Uh, a lot of people say this has a lot to do with the uh, slow recovery. But you also see the inflation number going up. At least uh, the CPI is about 5.4% uh, increase uh, in June compared to May. So uh, what does that say also about the U.S. in terms of uh, disrupted uh, uh, global supply chains? Yes, with regard to the global supply chain question, that's one of the battlefronts uh, that's being waged now between the United States and China. Uh, President Biden initiated upon his entry into office the 100-day review of the American supply chain. And that review was completed not too long ago, and now they're going to shift into the second phase whereby they will identify, the, identify those sectors and those industries whereby those companies will be required to re, uh, return a, a good deal of that supply chain to the United States. So we're still in the very early stages, but the areas such as semiconductors, pharmaceuticals, uh, you know, protective equipment, and, and things related to the health and safety of the American population, they're going to take a very hard look at that. And I would not be surprised at all if a portion of that supply chain is forcefully removed from China and returned to the United States. And so that's one aspect of this ongoing battlefront between the United States and China. How much would that mean in terms of uh, the shift of uh, uh, investment and also uh, profits of companies? Uh, is there a number that the U.S. has come up with? And what would that number mean for the U.S. consumers? I think that is one of the key questions because policymakers could say so, 
but realities could what could actually weigh the other way. Certainly, there will be a secondary and tertiary impact. You know, oftentimes when you when you initiate a policy, there are sometimes unexpected consequences, and indeed there may be some price inflation with regard to certain consumer goods. If those consumer goods are now you know resourced or you know yeah. brought back to the United States, we already saw 5.4 percent CPI from uh, yes, June to May. Yes, the United May. States is facing a, a a significant amount of consumer inflation, uh, particularly across uh, many primary commodities such as building materials, as well as the price of food. So agricultural commodities, proteins, meats, things like that. Have gone up beyond the rate of inflation,、yeah. and we haven't seen these kind of numbers, you know, certainly since、uh, 2008. And so, this is another worrying factor amongst economists here in the United States as to whether or not we are entering a new normal.、Uh, another indicator is also wage price inflation.、Uh, we're seeing across the board labor shortages in the United States for certain types of jobs, particularly in the blue collar sector. And so、uh, we're we're experiencing that, and there are many companies that are indicating that they have to raise their wages in order to attract employees. I see. Having said that, though, let's come back to the Chinese、uh, situation,、uh, Mr. Xie. One of the things being mentioned at that meeting over the weekend is about the highest level of local officials will be responsible for what they call. The fiscal and financial res,、uh, resilience management mechanism. Of course, this has a lot to do with China's governance style. Very much、uh, policies are government-driven,、um, and local government plays a big role in that. There's also concern about the local government debt. There's concern about private、uh, sector debt. And、uh, how do you add all of these up and see where the country actually is going in terms of handling all these unpredictabilities? Yeah, you know it, it's、uh, pretty complicated to manage a large country like China. So from Beijing standpoint, it's critical that the local officials in every localities will have to sort of work in a certain way so that you can enhance、uh, what you describe as the economic resilience of the country.、Mm-hmm. So what does it really mean? It means that the you know the local government officials are、um, should not be just looking for one-time big achievement. One time big deal, like you know, I I created a sharp increase in GDP this year, and then I go away.、Uh, that's not for the long term sustainable and resilient growth of China.、Mm. So every local government official is now charged with looking at this issue. Number one, on a holistic basis, not、right. on just one or two priorities. Second is that they have to look at it at least in the medium, if not the longer term. Number three is, as we said already, you know, there are certain boundaries that are red lines from the standpoint of the Chinese government, including things like data security, like the private education, that kind of stuff. That's also an input, important input into resilience across the whole country. Before we go, I do want to ask every one of you one final question regarding China's、uh, governance style in terms of economic policies. Everybody understands that this is a more government policy-driven economy. Uh, right now, particularly, and we do see other countries also becoming more federal、uh, government policy driven, but not as much as China. One could argue. So, what would that mean for investors、uh, overseas, for、uh, Chinese business owners, and for predicting the policies of、uh, China's economic uh, growth? Uh, what would that mean,、uh, Professor Dong? Well, in the United States, we have a, a you know a system of、uh, economic policy that is also, to an extent,、uh, driven by the federal government, but、right. a, a much less extent than China. One thing that China can do and do better than the United States is manage in an efficient manner. And so, when you have a single-party system,、uh, they can make decisions, and those decisions get pushed into the provinces very quickly. Whereas in the United States,、uh, you know. The sort of、uh, you know the difference between、uh, policy and action、uh, doesn't happen so swiftly. So、uh, much to、uh, you know China's benefit, that、uh, the system is far more efficient when it comes to the implementation of policy. And so I think from that、uh, from that point of view, maybe other nations around the world are perhaps starting to、uh, look at some aspects of the Chinese model, 
and say the coordination benefits that China can <coughs> impose perhaps could be uh, useful in our uh, in Western economy and Western settings as well. Interesting, Mr. Xie. Yeah, I think for, from a, from an investor standpoint, it's critical that they really have a good read on the directions of the governing policies, in particular for those who are investing in Chinese companies. And I, I think this, uh, you know, this Central Bureau meeting information uh, document actually is give out a lot of good information about the direction of the country. Mm -hmm. And so, if from an investor standpoint, if you read carefully about the uh, direction that the country is going, you can actually pick a lot of areas to invest, and uh, most likely you're going to get pretty good results as well. Mr. Xu, final words. Sure. Um, I think from investors' perspective, um, they need to look at a trade-off between efficiency and the fairness. Clearly, going forward, there will be more emphasis on equity and the fairness. Mm. Very interesting points and certainly the important points that all of you raised uh, through our conversation. Thank you so much, everyone of you, for your contribution. Arthur Dong, Edward Xie, Xu Sitao, really appreciate it. Thank you.